go ahead and pull that screen up. This is our masterclass on tricks and treats, practical skills for reactive dogs. So uh, practical skills for any dog, I'll say that as a general, but practical skills that we can teach and connect with our dogs outside of uh, just the standard obedience or rally training that I know has been used and often uh, overemphasized in our communities when we not every dog is able to concentrate at that high level of um, stimulation. So go ahead and click for me, yo. Welcome, welcome to everyone who is joining us. My name is Julie Fryman, the dog in the picture. That is my beautiful Opal Blossom and I will introduce her in just a minute. I am a Karen Cryer Academy certified training partner as well as a certified behavior adjustment training instructor. That is specifically uh, a, a reactive dog certification so that we can address the underlying cause of reactivity. So not just addressing the symptoms, what you're seeing, the behaviors on the surface, but everything that's underneath, we're going to go over why this uh, particular type of training can be so useful for you guys. And then my amazing company here in uh, Southern California, Canine Learning Academy, where I'm the general manager and head training. I have had the joy and pleasure of being with this company for about three years now. And i um, working with over five, I would say over 5,000, 7,000 dogs a year. So I have a lot of hands-on experience with this particular type of training. And I can tell you it works if you are committed to working it. Go ahead, yo. The materials that you need, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to go and grab, especially like a water bottle, or you can grab some paper towels, uh, roll something that your dog can bite or hold in their mouth. It might even be a toy that you have. We're going to be playing some uh, different trick games. So having a dog bed, a chair, or a cone, those are totally up to you. Whichever one you have, whichever one you want to use, your dog will be going around it. So it needs to be something that's stationary. A bucket or a box big enough to drop some toys in. We're going to have some alternative reinforcements. So whatever your dog really enjoys, whether that's dancing, whether it's fetch or tug, we wanna encourage you to use whatever your dog is most comfortable with and is going to reinforce those behaviors. Uh, long lasting chew for the in-between when we're asking them to rest. Chewing is a full body exercise for a lot of dogs. So helping that stress release when we bring that arousal up, we want to be able to balance it out with some rest and calm in between. They will definitely need a water bowl and a place to hang out in between while I am doing the boring human talking. We want our dogs to be comfortable and uh, managed in the area that you feel comfortable with. If that's on leash, if it's behind a gate, if you have an older dog, just kind of generally keeping them in the area because it'll be uh, work, work, talk, work, work, talk. So we're gonna balance it out a little bit with the education as well as the practical tools. Tasty treats and small bites. I always recommend something moist because the harder treats sometimes get choked on when we're doing multiple repetitions. So if you have something like a hot dog, some turkey treats or any kind of soft treat that you can break into tiny little pieces. Go ahead for me, yo. Or do we wanna give everyone a couple of seconds? I'll give you about a minute to grab these resources while I introduce my beautiful Opal Blossom. Opal Blossom is a sheepdog pit bull husky mutt mix from the shelter. She is 90 pounds and she is a beauty. She reacts with a big intimidating display. It will often shock people even that know her. It's a big rah, 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 get out of my face. And underneath all of that is a lot of fear and insecurity. It's difficult sometimes living in such a big city to find a calm or cool spot for us to walk and practice. So she learns new skills really quickly, but she also learns that her reactivity, her reactions can get her uh, what she wants, which is a dog to back up, which is a person to stop doing what they want. So she learned very quickly. She taught herself very quickly how to get people to listen to her very effectively. 
She is so, so, so smart. She graduated the Karen Pryor Academy with me. And I just always felt guilty that I couldn't walk her the way that I saw other people or that I didn't want to. She's 90 pounds. She's throwing me around. She's reacting to cats and kids and other dogs that are barking at her, which when you live in a city of millions of people, that can be very, very frustrating, even just to walk out of my door. So I just, as a trainer, I was beginning to shut down. You know, I should be able to walk my dog. My dog should be able to do this loose leash work. And I was stuck in that mindset of she has to do things the way that other dogs or that other trainers are performing at that level. So I had to adjust my expectations as well as my uh, approach to her behavioral needs. She loves to play. She loves dancing with me. It's not even possible for me to get up and do some movements or play without Opal being right there with me. And so I wanted to come up or, or discover a way where I could utilize the skills that she is passionate about without stressing her and me out on a daily basis. Did we have some questions, Yo, or where did the presentation go? Just pulled it down for a quick second. Let's just see okay. if you pull it right back up. Yeah, thank you. So Jody is in the chat. Remember, if you have any questions along the way, you want to give us some information about your dog, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Anything that is very relevant to what we're doing, we will stop and address it, or we can have a Q&A at the end to make sure you guys understand and absorb the information as fully as possible. Now, this is important. Listen up. Today's topics, we're going to be talking about effective training techniques observing and capturing the behavior that you want, that are, uh, your dog is doing well and successfully and building upon those skills to reach your training goals. How to teach a new trick, and we're going to be going over the, we're going to be practicing all together those new tricks, as well as finding your individual dog's motivation, making sure that we're working with the dog in front of us, not the dog that we think they should be or everyone else's dogs. This is about working with your dog one-on-one -on -one and creating that bond together. We're gonna to talk about building a trick sequence. So all of those things that you see in movies where the dogs are going and fetching a beer out of the fridge, or doing these huge you know, routines, jumping through a hoop and then dancing in between their mom's legs. We're gonna talk about how to actually build those routines and the sequences that build up into these uh, big elaborate behaviors that you, you see and, and a lot of people want to do right away. Alternative exercises. So not every dog needs to be walked every day and not every dog wants to be walked every day. So working with the dog in front of you and identifying the stress signals to where we need to recognize we may be pushing our dogs too far or they're not comfortable with the situation that they're in. Recognizing your dog's threshold, what a threshold is, what arousal is, and how we can both use that to connect with our dogs and recognize when it's just not possible to go any further. Taking it out into the real world, that's what this class is about, is not just trick training in your living room, but how to use these skills out in the practical environment that you live in and the importance of tracking your progress. We can quantify reactivity by measurements, by keeping diaries, by identifying where we are in our training. And oftentimes that's the only way to see progress because we're so close to the picture. And we wanna be able to back up, see where we're going and monitor those variations. Because if you've ever done any training, you know from A to B is not always the most effective route. Sometimes it's A to Z to P to O to all over the place. And we wanna be able to recognize that sometimes you have to work out of order to get into the mode, the training tricks that you want to get to.
I need about one minute, Julie. We okay. were capped out. We have over almost 1,000 people registered for this event, and it capped out on participants that can show up live at 100. I just fixed it, so we've got people coming in. So just give me one or two minutes, okay? Absolutely. So more about where this comes from. Um, one, I am an AKC evaluator, the American Kennel Club. My dog and I have multiple certifications in trick training. I can take Opal into a room of thousands of people. And if she is focused and she is on, we've got trick routines. She's going in between my legs. We're dancing. We're having a great time. And she'll do it all just to make me smile. However, if I were to relax, maybe be on my phone, talking to other people, immediately she's going to get overstimulated and often react in the way that seems very scary to other people, even though I know it's not directly threatening or directed at them. These are behaviors that she's learned and practiced that get other people to back up. Right. So maybe I wasn't communicating that most effectively. So she took it into her own hands. And now that she's four years old, she's gotten very good at that particular reaction. So let's click to the next one. Oh my gosh, we still have people coming in. I love it. I love it. So how dogs learn, there's a lot of different ways that we can teach our dogs effectively. This is what we would call uh, shaping. So taking a behavior, this is luring, taking a treat up to your dog's nose, showing them exactly where you want them to be, like a string attached to their nose. We're gonna go over to more of these in detail. Targeting, so being able to follow a target, placing a body part on a particular target, whether it's a stick or our hands. We're gonna go over shaping, meaning building skills a little bit at a time instead of expecting the whole trick or the whole series to just come about with our dogs automatically. And then capturing. One of my favorite things to do is pay attention when your dog is giving you the behavior that you would like. Instead of waiting to, uh, for them to react or be in a place that you do not want them to, we often ignore our dogs when they are actually doing what they, we want because we're, oh my God, finally I get a second of rest, right? Oh my gosh, I can ignore them for one single moment. So we're gonna talk about how, to, how dogs learn the importance of treat placement, of practicing and making sure that your dog understands exactly how we're teaching because every dog learns a little bit differently and all of these training skills are going to be uh, useful when we're doing the trick training. I, I know the playback is a little bit choppy. I saw that comment. That's because we have such a large group of people being here. Don't worry, we're gonna have all of the information that you need. So uh, we're gonna be getting up and doing these things together in just a moment. So on the next slide, you'll see that we want you to grab a water bottle or um, a paper towel roll or something like that. So go ahead and grab that really quickly. What we're gonna do is one single rep. So wait a second before you start, we're going to do one repetition. We're gonna offer our dogs this item, whatever it is, a water bottle, a, a paper towel roll, maybe even a toy, one time. So I want you to present it to your dog. You're gonna look at it like it's an amazing thing. And we're gonna observe exactly what our dog goes to first. So their, their default action. A default action may be they sniff it. They might come up and take it in their mouth. They might knock it over. They might wanna put their paw on it. So whatever your dog does, we're gonna accept that behavior. We're gonna do one repetition offer the item to your dog, see how they interact with it, mark it immediately, meaning yes or click. So you're gonna identify the moment that they participate in the activity, and then you're gonna toss a treat away and we're gonna continue with our next activity. So everyone go ahead and grab that item. We're going to present it to our dogs, either on the floor or out of our hands. See how your dog interacts with it one time, the moment that they are able to touch, put it in their mouth, 
sniff it. You're going to mark that behavior. How can I mark behavior with a deaf dog? Excellent question. So oftentimes we do a thumbs up so that the dog knows exactly when they've done the behavior. So a mark is an identifier to where your dog was or what they did at that particular moment. So we have other deaf dogs where we do a thumbs up real quick and then you're gonna toss the treat away. So I'm gonna give everyone the opportunity to do that. Present your item to your dog. See how they interact with it. Mark it, yes, thumbs up, click, and then toss that treat away. So if you do not have a dog, you're listening. Otherwise, your dog may be asleep. You can watch what the other dogs are doing. Just one rep, because we wanna make sure to build on that behavior in our next activity. So go ahead and type in the chat, what are some of the things that your dog did with the object? Did they touch it with their nose? Did they hit it with their butt? Did they pick it up? Did they sniff it? That's okay if she's interested in the bottle, that's gonna, told, that's gonna help you very much in the next activity. Touched it with her nose, interesting. Sniff then grab, awesome. That means your dog probably enjoys having things in their mouth, right? Like a golden, like a spaniel, like a poodle. Those are dogs that carry things in their mouth. So they often put just about anything in their mouth. Used a large cup, stuck his head in it. That's a great behavior. That means that he is comfortable putting his face or snoot into a small enclosed environment. Not every dog is comfortable with doing that. Sniffed it. Great behavior, I love a good sniff. So we're gonna go ahead into our next activity. Hopefully everyone got one repetition with their item. Now we're going to encourage doing that activity over and over again. So if it's a sniff, the closer your dog gets to actually touching the bottle when you present it, it's gonna look like this. I'm gonna present my object. My dog has come forward. They might grab it with their mouth. Yes, toss the treat away, pick up the object, present it again, whether it's on the floor or out of your hand. We're going to strengthen this behavior a little bit at a time. So teaching whatever, whatever behavior they do naturally, we're gonna build that into a bigger behavior, whether it's coming from a distance, holding it for a longer time, or doing it around more distractions. Some of you have multiple dogs in the room. Some of you have other people in the house that are walking around. So let's see what your dog does. And if you can continue to strengthen the behavior that they first offered. So not what you thought they were gonna do, but what they actually did. So I'm watching the, the chat over here, sniff then chomp, great. Maybe you strengthen the nose touch there where she's able to go and take her nose and knock it over. Maybe they put it in their mouth. You could teach them to hold it for a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Mark every second they're able to go and then remove the object and toss a treat in her mouth and wants to tear it up. Let's see if we can work on a drop then, trading the item for another item or for reinforcement. So working on the behavior of take it and then drop it. My dog's nose and then waits for my client's dog will drop to grab, will try to grab. So that's, uh, we wanna toss the treat away to get their attention away from the object so that they can come back and interact with it again. We're gonna do this for about 60 more seconds, building upon the object. I love that, grabbed it, ran away, come back and dropped for a treat. Perfect. That means that they are a great retriever. I taught my dog to always come back when he has something in his mouth. If you can show it to me, guess what? You might get something better or I might give it right back to you to continue playing with it. That's a great, yes, grabs it with mouth. So if your dog is grabbing it with mouth, hold off a second, count one, to then mark it, yes, and toss the treat. Awesome, Cassie, that was so good. And how they picked it back up and gave it to you. 
So good. I love that. Do they kick it with their paw? Is anyone doing a, a paw where they kind of knock it over or they touch it in your hand? Touches it with his nose, but only me holding it. That's okay because we want to build on presenting that object and then they come and touch it doing that over and over, tossing it away, and then you're gonna show it and maybe set it down on the floor. Add a cue to it, touch, yes, toss treat. Touch, yes, toss treat. Then placing it on the floor. Got duration to the nose touch, holding their nose to the object. I love that idea, that's a great one. Another time offered touching with a foot. So that means that your dog is very diverse in how they're comfortable interacting with each object. That is awesome, guys. Using what your dog is made or driven to do, we can build upon those skills a little at a time. So if your dog is, uh, is a nose dog, if they're a paw dog, think of the options instead of just a water bottle, teaching them to put their paw on a post-it so that they can close doors. Teaching your dog to put a nose on an object so you can ask them to go and check things out away from you so they're not so scared. If we can offer a novel object and say touch, we're gonna be able to have our dog interact with more things, not when they're overly fearful, but let's say a flag is blowing in the wind, they've never seen that. We could have our dog go up and touch the flag to make sure that they can process, that's just a still item. It's not something that's coming to get me. So give your dog a break for a second, get them some water. There are three ways that we use, or four ways, sorry, I can't count. Uh, there's four ways that we use targeting in our training. One of them being a nose touch. A lot of you just did that with your water bottle. So offering an item and having them put their nose on your hand or on another object. Paw target, meaning exactly what it sounds like, putting your paw either in your hand or on an object, whatever has been presented to them. And you'll notice in a lot of these videos, we're taking the object away in between the tree so that we can put it back to have that target there. Oftentimes when we leave a target out, the dog is confused because now it's just a part of the environment. So being able to present it as a novel object. Body targeting, which is going to your bed, settle on a mat. A lot of times we can have dogs push their body up against the wall for different things. This is how we get um, hyenas to do blood draws, moving them into uh, small areas or going through tunnels. That's a body target because we want their body to interact with the object. Chin target, very, very useful. This is one we're gonna practice in just a minute. Having your dog come and place their chin in your hand on your lap. This can be useful for service dogs. These are the four basic foundation behaviors that you should teach your dog to build upon to get other tricks or other sequences. So we start with these four and then the nose target may be going into a weave and doing a dance around. But first, they have to be able to know that their nose is supposed to be directed onto an item or onto our hand. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna break down the chin target. Does anyone have any questions about these four target categories? If you do, go ahead and type it in the chat. I'd love to answer, or one of my amazing partners will drop in and hopefully clarify some things. So these are the basic foundations of how we build upon any of our tricks. This is going to be recorded and you're gonna get an email a little bit later with the link of this live recording. So if you need to go, you're absolutely gonna have access to it a little bit later to even share with any of your family or friends. I wanna ask a question to everyone here. If you teach your dog a regular paw target, maybe your right paw or left paw, what is a trick that you can teach that comes from a paw target? Julie mentioned it a little earlier, but you can unmute if you want to raise your hand and just say, oh, I know that one. 
What's a trick you can teach your dog that stems from, Jenna said high five, crossing your legs. Oh, I like that I one. That. Yeah. Wave. Waves. Up. Say hi. <laughs> Absolutely. How about a body target? So what does targeting means? It means taking a specific part of the dog's body and then bringing it to an object that the pet parent or trainer would like them to do. So what's a body target that you can use as a trick? Go to, Go to the mat. Very good. So remember taking their body, any part of their body, and putting it on an object or placing it where we would like them to be. All right. Who's ready to teach a chin target? Great job, Jenna. Cooperative care. I love that. Going to the vet and being having your dog be comfortable laying down on a mat or stepping onto the scale, which can be very uh, uh nerve wracking for a lot of dogs because it's a different texture. Backing up, having your dog back away from things that are over stimulating, right? Maybe you have food in your hand, your dog's in the hallway, they're going crazy because you've got food in your hand, teaching them to back up and back away so that you can get into the place that you're going. Shoulder targeting, very good, especially for physiotherapy. Getting into the car and laying down teaching them to be comfortable in new environments by lowering the stimulation and the arousal. Awesome answers, guys. All right, so we are going to go into this together. This is a chin target. Yo, I'm gonna have you like stop the video at each point. So taking food and bringing your dog forward, have them engage with the food first, meaning they might nibble on it. They might just sniff and start licking your hand then you're going to have your hand there very still. Remember not to push up on your dog's head. The goal is for this hand to be still and this hand to move them forward. So at first we're going food, hand. When the food is gone, both hands are removed. So getting your dog comfortable with having someone or something on their face. Right? This can be really good practice for cleaning their eyes, for cleaning out their ears. The first step is luring forward and holding that chin in your hand. The second step, pulling forward and then going down. The goal is for your dog to actually press down into your hand. So be very conscious about not pushing up. Their goal is to push down. So coming all the way forward and then pulling that tree straight down to add in that extra little pressure that they're pulling down. Then you're going to work on getting that treat out of your hand. So doing targeting, presenting your hand, having them follow the hand and adding duration to one, two, three. They're pushing down into your hand for longer periods of time. Think of how this could be a safety thing, right? When you're trimming your dog's eye hair, if you have a doodle or any dog with long hair, cleaning those eye goopies, practicing for muzzle training or petting sensitive areas. If we can keep our dog's head forward, we're more likely to be able to go around them and touch them in sensitive areas. So food comes forward, hand is there, food is gone, hands are gone. Repeat that several times and then you're going to pull straight down so that your dog begins to press their chin into your hand. Remember food gone, hand gone. Then we're going to work on just doing it without the food, having your hand there and acting like there's food. Mark, yes, and then, then treat afterwards. We're gonna add some duration as your dog becomes comfortable doing it, pressing their chin into your hand. Keep your target hand totally still, totally still. So if you need to rest it on your, your knee or lock your elbow into your stomach, you're gonna hold that target hand very, very still. The only hand that's moving is the one with the food in it. All right, so we're gonna take the, the presentation down. We're gonna do this all together to practice. My amazing partner here, Yo, is gonna be spotlighting people. 
if any, oh, and this is Michelle's dog, Logan. I wanna really highlight that because she has provided um, this awesome little tutorial for us and we wanna give, give notice for the beautiful Logan in this video as well. So food, your dog commits to it, then pulling them forward with that very still hand present. Hold the target there the entire time. Try not to bring your hand back and then present it, bring your hand back. Even if your dog is a little bit weary, you're gonna hold that hand there very, very still until we can have them come forward one little tiny inch at a time. Wonderful. Really great job, guys. So if your dog is just interacting one little tiny step at a time, guess what? You're still going to mark that. Even if their, their nose only comes forward, you're going to say yes, remove your hand, treat to the mouth. So yes, remove your hand, treat to the mouth. Wonderful, Sydney, that was awesome. Even though it was a, only a moment, this is the point where marking, letting your dog know exactly when they did it correctly. And that is with a yes, a click, or if you have a deaf dog, that awesome thumbs up and then some food is gonna come for you. Dawn, killing it. See if you can leave your hand there while you're feeding. It looks like you already have the treat out of your hand, so you're gonna be feeding while your dog's chin is resting on your hand. Beautiful, Christy, I love it. So feeding your dog while they're in your hand, making sure that you can touch sensitive areas like around the eyes, maybe even checking on their nose. Sometimes dogs have boogers too and we wanna be able to clean their faces. Great job. Yay, Beryl, we did this in our tricks class. I'm so excited to see some of you returning for the master class after our tricks series. Keep that target hand very, very still. Great job, Dawn, I see that, I see that, that's perfect. Remember when the food is gone, your hand is gone. Food is gone, hand is gone. Gonna do it for 30 more seconds. Remember that if your dog is backing away, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to recognize that, hey, we've never done this before. And maybe my dog is a little wary of putting their head onto my hand. You might have it rest on your knee. So someone type in the chat or unmute yourself, what are the ways that we can use a chin target to either interact or build upon a trick. Anyone, how can you see using a chin target out in the real world, in your daily life? My dog is trying to mouth the hand target. So that means that we need to wait until they fully committed to the treat. If your dog is mouthing on your hand, then that means they're not actually committed to that food. You may need something Time. longer lasting. Perfect. We may need something longer lasting like jerky or a hot dog, something that they can really nibble on while your hand is there. Because if they're going after your hand, then what's in your hand is not important enough to them. Vet visits, very good. Vet visits, vets or grooming. How else Holy can time. you see this? Yeah. Time, yeah, time, time tells. So let's all give a break. Let's give a break to our dogs. Everyone rest. We have more things to do. We don't want to overwork them. I use a chin target to check, check my Ridgeback's ears. Very good. Dogs with floppy ears sometimes get yeast infections in them. We got to be able to do ear drops or clean their ears for them. Wonderful, guys. That was awesome. All right, we're going to move on to our next one. So luring. Luring is taking a treat or a reinforcement 
and having your dog follow it like there's a string attached to their nose. So if it's not a treat, it may be a toy, something that they're willing to come forward and follow, almost like, oh my God, there's chocolate in front of me. I'll follow you to the end of the earth, right? So you're taking the food, you're holding it in your hand, and then you're going to, for this, Yep, it's important to wait until I'm done. We don't wanna overwork our dogs. So just take a break for five seconds. I promise we'll get right back to it. So we're gonna use this to do spin and twist. A lot of people don't know, but your dog is right or left sided. So one side will always be easier for them to turn or to offer, but we wanna make sure that our dogs are balanced on both sides physiologically. This helps with muscle, this helps with flexibility. So if we play it one more time for me, yo, you're gonna take the food in your hand. You're gonna lure them into a spin. If you have a big dog, I advise bringing them forward and then out to your side. You can see me doing that here with my beautiful Opal Blossom. She's following the treat in my hand. I'm not giving it to her until she's completed the full rotation. Following the other way, Go very slow at first. Once you've done it a couple of times, we're gonna get the treat out of your hand and we're gonna mark that behavior, meaning they're following our hand. We say yes, and then we're gonna reinforce it. The goal- If, go if you it. get the food out of your hand um, pretty quickly, so if you're using targeting and you've got a small dog, you're also welcome to use something like a wooden spoon so you don't have to bend over or you could sit down on the couch and do this so that you're not having to stand over your dog. Yes, we wanna create luring as a short-term experience so that your dog does not rely on you always having food in your hand because it's gonna be very difficult to do that later in life when you're out in the real world. So first we start by teaching the behavior with the treat in our hand. Once they've done it three times perfectly, I want you to try to take the food out of your hand, same motion that you're doing. Try to get them to do it both ways. In Canine Learning Academy, we call this right or left. You can name it spin, circle, twist, whatever you'd like to do. So we're gonna get up right now. Everyone can get their treats and get their dogs. We're gonna do this all together. For large or long dogs, remember to go wide and try not to lean over them. Bring the treat towards you and out to the side. A lot of times when we lean over our dogs, their first reaction is to back up. Three minutes on the clock, three minutes. Three minutes, awesome. Yeah, so some of you have dogs that already know this, but they're automatic on one side. So let's add in that other side to make sure that they're balanced. Love that. Once you can do it three times perfectly with the treat in your hand, go ahead and take that treat out of your hand. See if you can name it, spin or twist, or circle, right, left, whatever you prefer. While they're in the middle of the trick, you're going to name it. Remember to mark when they make the full circle, yes, and then treat at the end position. Oh my God, Cassie's doing this at a distance. Oh, Debbie is doing it with two labs right now. I'm very, very impressed. But one looks older, one looks younger. So if you have two dogs, you can actually do like a turntable. You can do both of them and have them circle out. But remember, if your dogs are overstimulated, work with them one at a time. One at a time will give you enough time to trade out your dogs as well. If they're used to practicing together, you're gonna do a great job having them practice in the same space. For little dogs, get down to their level or grab a wooden spoon, like Yo said, so you don't have to bend over. No, when you have a dog, 
who won't complete, do you break it up into parts? Oh my God, Margo, I love that question. Yes. If your dog is struggling making the full circle, you're going to lure halfway or even a quarter way and then yes and treat. Then you're going to go halfway. Yes and treat. Uh, then, can work. Once they make three fourths of the circle, we're going to be able to mark it and treat back where we want them, which is facing us at the end point. Yes. Our goal this year is to get it verbally only. So first you start with the lure, then going into targeting time, then perfect. Thank you so much. Yo, everyone get, take a break, grab some water, grab some water. We're going to be putting these tricks together. So don't feel like, oh, that was fun. I want to stay on that. We are coming right back to these tricks. Okay. Absolutely. Recognize if your dog is stressed or frustrated, we don't want to push them past their point. So if they've done it a couple of times, they failed. Maybe you feel like you, can, you don't have the mechanics. Take a break, take a big breath. You can always come back and do some more of this. So shaping. Shaping is a behavior that we're taking a big block of whatever your dog is offering and we're whittling it down little by little by little until we get the picture that we're hoping for. So here you can see just like what we did in the beginning, Yo is setting down an object, the dog comes to interact with it, she's marking and then resetting. So tossing the treat away so that the dog will finish where we'd like them to. And it gives them the opportunity to come back for another repetition. Wait until we do this together. We don't want to tire your dogs out too much. So presenting the object, letting them interact or try something. You're going to mark and then toss that treat. Teaching, I mean, uh, uh, where you place your treat is very, very important because it's gonna give them the opportunity to come back to keep interacting. Wherever you want your dog to end up or go back to starting is where you're gonna treat. If you have a service dog or a dog who spends an hour looking for the treat in the carpet, try using a bowl or something like a blanket where they can find it very easily. Some dogs have difficulty finding it on our carpets or something like that. We're gonna teach wrap. We're gonna teach our dogs how to wrap around an object, like going around a pole, going around a cone. You can use a bowl, a chair, anything for that. And Yo is gonna go over the step-by-step-by-step -step -step of this one. All right, so you're gonna place an object directly in front of you. I'm gonna find Matthias, who's going to do a live demonstration, unless there is someone here that has a wrap. Cassie, you have a wrap? Okay. Cassie, I'm gonna spotlight you for a second. I would like you to take an object and place it perfect. She's got a cone. And place it in front of you, just directly in front of you. You're gonna stand about six inches away from the cone. Correct. And now I want you to take your um, right hand, which is closest to your dog. Oh, that's so cute. That was really cute. I know. Let's just say that, let's just go with that. Whatever your dog offers, that's fine. But I want you to reward your dog with the opposite hand where your dog is. And I want you to place that treat on the ground in front of the cone. Go ahead. Treat placement is important. You're going to place the treat on the, yep. Put the cone down. Dog does something, even looks at it. Look at the cone. Take your glasses off and look at the cone. <laughs> okay. So let's place that That's cone fine. Yep, a little bit further from your dog. So they have it. There we go. Yes. And then I want you to toss the tree to reset your dog so they have the opportunity to come back towards it. So we're going to get the dog to interact with the cone first. So I want you to place the treat in front of the cone on the ground. So the dog, yep, all the way to the ground. Now place one on this side away from your dog on the cone. Yep, there we go. And now I want you to back up, back up, just back up and toss the treat behind you. There we go. I'm going to do that again. Come up towards the cone. Perfect. 
Yes. Mark, reward, toss the treat behind you. Excellent. So you're creating a drive. The dog goes around perfect market and toss there. I'm sorry, drop the treat and toss it behind you to reset. Okay, okay. now start to do this again, but I want you to wave your hand around the cone. So walk on over to the cone. The dog probably already has a wrap, but that's fine. Perfect. Yes. And reward reset. So go ahead and keep going as I talk over this. So when you're first starting off teaching a wrap, you're going to want to walk really close to the cone so the dog understands that that's the object. And you'll progressively get a little further away. So Cassie, stand a little further. There she goes. Now she took out her foot movement and just simply used her hand. Now, in um, as you get advanced in this, your right hand might mean go around the cone one direction and your left hand might be going around the cone the other direction. Watch this. And yep, I knew she had it right <laughs> and left. If your dog is in Canine Learning Academy in our all day school, this is something that they learn. It's a wrap right and left. All right. So I want everyone to stand up and practice this. Take any object that you have in your house, a chair, a cone, a plant, and just practice treat placement and shaping a behavior going in the right direction. All right, Julie. Thank you, Cassie. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. So for our advanced dogs, you can add in another object to add, have them go wrap, wrap like a figure eight. If this is the first time you're doing this, you're going to start off just like she said, placing the object having your dog interact with it at all, coming towards, looking at it, uh, putting their nose there, and then treating on the other side, and then tossing a treat to reset them. Two minutes for wrap, two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, I love that Pam, she's using a trash can. Not everyone has cones at their house. I totally recognize that. You can use a chair or a cone. Awesome. Yes, agility dogs. This is part of your training for weaves. Oh, wow, Cassie, she like rebalanced that for you. That was great. Going all the way around the object. There we go. Good job, Cindy. Wait until your dog comes a little bit further forward to then mark and toss to the other side. Cheryl, that's perfect. Yes, toss there and then toss one behind you. That's okay. It's okay if they come back on the same direction. If your dog doesn't know this behavior yet, you're going to stand still and let them figure it out. Shaping means that we're watching and letting our dogs think about it. So try not to move your body too much. Stay close to the cone at first. That's it, Kim. Yes, drop treat and then Perfect. toss one behind you. Shaping you're bringing, is one step at a time. You're bringing a new object into your home and you're asking your dog to go interact with it. Placing some treats in the uh, near the object is going to help give, build confidence and help your dog not be so afraid. So Kim, this is really good example of this. Yes. 20 seconds, Julie. Okay. Mark, uh, um, Jody, could you answer that question in the chat about how to see everyone in the uh, group view? Wonderful. It's okay if your dog comes back on the same direction. Remember to start very close to the object. Once they can do it with you being very close, you can start to back up. Time. Okay, everyone take a break. My dog keeps climbing with paw on trick. That's okay if it's a bucket. So you may, they may already have an association with that particular object. So you may need a different object like a chair or a cone. Finding your dog's motivation, so important. This is Molly in our school program. Molly will work 
just for the sake of doing more work. She loves, yes, everyone give your dog a break. Let them grab some water. Just chill out for a second. Some dogs work a long time for toys. Some dogs are more toy driven than they are focused on their treats. Sniffing is a great motivation. Let's say your dog does a high five, then maybe toss the tree in the grass so that they can go and sniff and interact with the environment. It doesn't always have to be treats. We want to find your dog's motivation so that you can use this at all times, no matter what's around you. And changing up the motivation is what we're going to practice. Having your dog do multiple things in a row, right? So there's the food, cutting it up into tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces, but also doing two or three activities and then letting them go and dig and get out some of that frustration. Using sticks, as long as your dog doesn't eat them, using sticks or play. Chase, you saw the, the flirt pole becoming the squirrel that your dog is always focused on. So what we're gonna practice right now is alternating your rewards, not just using the food, but sometimes using petting. My dog loves a good butt scratch, that's her favorite. Verbal praise, you're gonna be your dog's cheerleader. Yeah, dude, you totally did it. Grabbing a toy, like a tug toy or a chase toy, having them chase it on the floor if your dog is very focused on moving objects. Fetch. Fetch is a really good one. You can have your dog do a trick, toss the ball, have them bring it back, drop it, then we do it all over again. So alternating the reward, you're gonna do four or five behaviors and each time you're gonna use a different reinforcement. So sometimes the reinforcement may be going outside, chasing mom or dad, playing on the floor. You might get down on the floor on your back and play like a dog for a minute and then get back up and doing the training again. So we're going to put three minutes on the clock. Choose at least three behaviors that your dog knows very well. And each time you're going to choose a different reinforcement. So what does your dog love or want the most? Is it your attention? My dog will do things for applause. She's a ham and a half. So sometimes all I have to do is have a big smile on my face. Start the timer, her. Julie. Oh, jo uh, can Jody, can you start the timer for me? Please? I got a timer. Just want me oh. to start it? Yes, right. please. All right, gonna keep this on gallery view. For those of you guys just watching, you're gonna take the view to gallery view. You're gonna be able to see everyone that's working. What is your dog's favorite reinforcement? If you are watching, what are some alternative reinforcements that you can think of? Our trainers in the room, how do you use other reinforcements during your training? Chewing, that's a great one. That's a really, really good one. Yeah, especially very mouthy breeds like, oh, I don't know, a Malinois might want to chew on something very hard right after they do something. Tug, very good. High, dry do high drive dogs love going back and forth between training and play. Alternate your reward. Have them do a behavior, then tug. Do a trick, then petting. So alternate the reward. Every trick or every behavior. A spin is my dog's reward. Yes, sometimes it's the next trick. My dog loves a good high five as her reward. So asking her to do something and then letting her do a high five. So default behaviors can be very reinforcing when we're learning new things. Love that. Trainers, what else are you using in your classes? One minute left. Dancing with dogs. Yes, having a little dance party. Being silly, getting on the floor and wiggling with your dog. I do. So sometimes if I use toys and food, they won't play with the toy if the food is on me. Okay, so starting with a toy then. Starting with a toy, then using praise. 
then having chase and maybe food is your last thing that you're using instead of putting it out there first to do more repetitions. And that's time. Everyone take a break. Take a break, grab your dog a drink of water, grab yourself a drink of water if you're playing and running around. So what was your dog's most passionate reinforcement? What were they the most excited to get out of those behaviors? Go ahead and type it in the chat for us. What is your dog's ultimate reinforcement? Like I said, mine is clapping. My dog loves a good applause. Chase, chase a toy. Squeaky tennis ball, I like that. Yes, sometimes just the annoying squeak over and over and over again could be the reinforcement. Always food for my dogs, tug is second. Then that means that we get to practice more. If your dog's number one is food, then you may take a whole training session just to do toys and seek, find and seek and running around, doesn't wanna be petted. That's okay with your dog's level. Awesome, so alternating your rewards to make sure that you are able to reinforce your dog where they're at when they're there. Behavior chaining, this is what I'm talking about when we see those big, long uh, dance routines or being able to do extended tricks like this one, having your dog go and pick up their toys. We use what's called back chaining for this one, which means we practice the last behavior first. So if I'm having my dog go away from me, pick up a toy, hold it, carry it back, and then drop it in a bucket, the most important part of that is that they actually hit the bucket. So I'm going to practice giving my dog a toy and having them drop it in the bucket over and over until I know that that very last part is solid. Then I'm going to add some distance. Instead of handing my dog the toy, I'm going to put it on the floor or I might hold it just closer to the floor, have them pick it up, come back, put it in the bucket. Then we work on getting it a little farther away from the bucket. So using distance to continue practicing. Not all chains need to be back chained. However, that can be a really useful thing if the last part of the chain is most important. So what are the behaviors that it takes to teach a dog how to pick up their toys? Trainers, go it ahead. Pick yep. up your toys and put it into a bucket or pick up uh, empty water bottles and put it into a bucket. Great, someone, Karen, hold a toy, perfect. Hold. Someone wanna unmute and give us all of those? I already got some good answers in the chat for sure. Yeah. Hold, pick up, drop, fetch, love it. Even fetch itself can be broken down into smaller pieces, right? Fetch is going away from me, getting something, picking it up, bringing it back, dropping it in front of me. That is four behaviors that we are chaining together, which is why it's often really difficult for puppy parents. They go, well, my dog's not going far enough. I want them to be able to go 20 yards and go and get it and bring it back. Well, first we've got to make sure that they can even hold it in their mouth, build up that mouth strength. So a trick sequence is adding these behaviors, one, two, three, four. We're going to work our way up hopefully to five. This is what we were able to accomplish in our previous trick class. So our trick series that we do that six weeks these are all the behaviors that we were able to practice individually and then put them in different orders. So going, oh yeah. So what we're gonna do is take any of these known behaviors and we're going to chain them together. 
So you might start with the newest trick that you've learned, like rap or maybe chin. You're gonna practice that and reinforce it every single time. So chin, yes, treat, chin, yes, treat. Then we're gonna put something directly in front of that trick, like go to place, yes, treat, and then chin, yes, treat. So each individual behavior is gonna be reinforced until you've done it several times. Then it would be go to bed and then chin, and then a yes and treat. I want you guys to build this up one step at a time. So at first, you're gonna start with your end behavior, reinforcing that all by itself. Then as you build it, when you would mark, so let's say chin, yes, when I would mark is when I would next cue the behavior. So the timing of this is really important because if you wait too long between the tricks, your dog's gonna go, well, why didn't I get the treat? So the treat becomes continuing on to the next activity. First, you're gonna start reinforcing one thing at a time. Then you're gonna put one thing in front of it, go to your place and then come back and do a chin, then yes, treat. Then building into three tricks, one treat two, treat, three, treat. Then adding in one, two, treat, one, two, three, treat. So all of these are examples of different kinds of tricks. I'm sure some of you have a million in your pocket, but do what your dog is able to do. So what are you hearing me say when I'm talking about a trick sequence? What are the foundations of building a trick sequence? Meaning adding more behaviors in line with each other. What are you hearing me say? Anyone go ahead and pull it up in the chat or unmute yourself, chaining and back chaining. So Denise, what do you, what am I saying when I say chaining or back chaining? Start with one at a time, very good. Anyone wanna unmute? Our trainers, come on, I know you know this. If you are a trainer, ensure you've practiced the trick reliably before sequencing it together. Yes. So making sure each behavior is very solid as we're building upon the next one. Increasingly difficult. So why might we put the most difficult thing at the end and practice it first? What's the purpose of back chaining? What's the purpose of doing things backwards or teaching it backwards? Yes, the dog will know the answer. Yes, yes, yes. So we want that crescendo at the end to be the big boom. More practice for that harder trick. Yes, because when we're building it backwards, we have a hundred reps for that last one. And then we have, you know, 99 and 98 and 95. So making sure that that conclusion is a huge, awesome finish. And then that awesome finish is reinforcing in itself. The final behavior is the strongest. Absolutely. So we're going to do this all together. We're going to take the presentation down. We're going to practice this. You're going to pick up to five behaviors, but you're going to start with one at a time. One behavior, mark treat. One behavior, mark treat. Then add on one behavior at a time. Your goal is to get up to five, but it's okay if you only get to one or two today. It might just be hold and drop. Those are two behaviors. So first you're gonna reinforce hold over and over. Well, first you're gonna reinforce drop, but you have to put something in their mouth to get them to, to hold it. 
So it goes drop, drop, drop. Then work on the duration of the hold. Treat, then drop. Right, one behavior at a time. Dog practices hardest behavior more often. Wow, these are great answers in the chat. As you're building the trick afterwards, becomes up to five tricks. We're gonna have three minutes on the clock. Yo is gonna be our timer. Three minutes on the clock. Go ahead and start. Some very simple behaviors. Oh, Debbie, I love that you're just kind of snuggling with your dog right now. That's so great. Yeah, he's tired. Let him take a break. You can always practice this later. So pick the behaviors that your dog knows very well. You can always go back and add all these complicated dancing routines. But simple things like a paw placement, going to your bed, even catching it. I know more than one dog in here loves catching things in their mouth. Awesome, Dawn, I love that. That was one paw, then two paw. So those are two separate behaviors. That counts as two different behaviors. Right paw, yes, treat. Left paw, yes, treat. Then building, right paw, left paw, yes, treat. Spin, wrap, putting things in a basket, sit. Does your dog know how to sit? Have them do a sit and then a down. Maybe a sit down stand, which is what we call puppy push up and having them reorganize it. So this also promotes active listening, which means that your dog is paying attention to when you're cueing the behavior. They have to listen because they don't know what's coming next. So they're actively, oh, Cheryl's so good. Yay, we got him to drop it in the basket. That was awesome. Going over your leg, going under your leg. Beautiful. How many more seconds do we have? 35 seconds. 35 seconds. See if you can get up to three or four behaviors in a row if you practice them already. You'll see some of these people are practicing big long chains because they do this regularly with their dog whether it's dancing and freestyle or agility or even just building in that awesome fetch routine. Very good, Cheryl and Chandler, yay! Oh, that's awesome. Time. All right, everyone, take a break. Chill out for a second, grab some water. Have your dog have a resting place. Make sure they are comfortable resting after these things. So <clears throat> when you have a reactive dog, it can be difficult to do what society is asking us to walk your dog five times a day. That's not always what's best, especially if walking is stressful for you and your dog, like I mentioned before. So trick training is not only promoting active listening, but it can be a very physical task to do. Alternative exercises for reactive dogs might include sniffaris, going to a new location and sniffing their hearts out to really calm themselves down and feel like they're a part of the environment. Trick training, great bonding and focus exercises, working out with your dog, having you do sit-ups and your dog high-five you, doing up-downs, like you stepping up, them jumping up, you stepping down, them jumping down. We do what we call urban agility, which is the top right video, using the environment that you have around you to practice pause up or wrap around a light pole. 
jumping up and off of benches, especially if you have a dog that loves to jump, but we don't wanna reinforce that on people, we can use it out in the environment. We can use our dog's skills that they find most enjoyable. Doing enrichment feeding, utilizing your dog's everyday meals and putting them in different problem solving activities to work their brain, to work their mind, to work their nose. It is a very tiring thing when we have mental enrichment. Creating a scavenger hunt, hiding things around the house, right? Putting your dog behind a fence, hiding eggs or cups of different kinds of smelly foods. Hide and seek, tossing something down a hallway and running into a room, calling your dog and see if they can come and find you. All of these behaviors are very natural dog ways to exercise. If we left our dog alone for a couple of days, they're not gonna figure out how to put that leash on and then go and walk around our block. They're gonna occupy themselves with different activities. They might get into trouble or we can create situations that they can, we can redirect those problem behaviors, digging in the trash, jumping on people, well, what if we had an enrichment where we had food in there and they were digging through? That would satisfy that natural digging instinct. My dog loves to make big sounds, knock things over all the time. So bowling, knock it, having her place things in a basket where it's boom. It's funny to her, she thinks it's awesome. So instead of letting her squeak, squeak, squeak all around the house all the time, I'm allowing her to get out that natural, uh, what I would consider annoying, but it's a totally natural dog behavior. And I'm using that to exercise her. So exercise does not necessarily mean walking. It means enjoying the physical activity that they're doing, which means for some people, that have a bite history with their dog, for some people who have been dragged out in the street with their dog, we need to reassure them that it is okay to not have to walk your dog every day. Yes, potty is important, but we don't always have to get them out and expose them to stressors if that's not what they're able to handle. We wanna recognize stress signals in our dogs so we don't push them too far. A few of them might be yawning, barking excessively, not just barking for fun, but everyone's dog has a different bark for different activities. Scratching, excessive scratching or doing it when they're frustrated. Lip licking, ignoring, avoiding, or demonstrating those big wide eyes we have here in the middle where they pull their eyelids back and show you all of the white of their eyes. Crinkled forehead, very frustrated. I'm thinking, I know some dogs naturally have all those extra uh, forehead wrinkles, but we wanna watch out for when our dog's face is very tense because the more they're constricting their muscles, the more they're wearing out that internal energy. It's also important to realize that good stress and bad stress both cause our dog to increase the adrenaline, the cortisol, and it can stack. Using this diagram, you can see that maybe a squirrel and then a playtime with friend and then mom comes home could elicit, boom, a big explosion because they've been stacking that arousal. It doesn't always have to be a bad thing. It doesn't have to be they pulled us down the street or they barked at another dog. Good arousal over excitement counts as well. The reactivity threshold that you'll see, that dotted line, this is the point at which learning stops. So this is a threshold chart, having us understand where our dog's threshold is and it's going to change daily, just like with us. If you start off well rested, you had a great breakfast, you had a wonderful, like your husband kissed you goodbye, you're going off to work, you're gonna have a more productive day. 
But if you spilled coffee on yourself, you're running late, your hair is a mess, you get into the office, your boss yells at you, there's a good chance you're gonna explode. And recognizing that in our dogs, we can increase their ability to handle these stressors by balancing them, creating an environment where they can do a high drive activity like chasing or playing tug, and then balancing it out with a calming activity. Settle on a mat, go to your place, sit with duration. So we want our dogs to be elastic, to be able to stretch that energy up and then come down. So if you can practice that in your house, we can more easily utilize that recovery when we're out and about. We're gonna talk about that more on the next slide. So just remember that that threshold is the end of learning and retention. It's important when we have reactive dogs or reactive dog clients that we encourage tracking because tracking each day, we may find a concentration of information. We may notice that it's worse when it's raining, it's better when it's sunny or flip-flop. So time of day that incidents happen. Incident could be anything from jumping on your door or barking at the dog across the street. How long were they reacting? The benefit of tracking these activities are not only so that we can identify clusters of information, but we can give our dogs the opportunity to improve slowly. Like I said, when you have a reactive dog, often us and our clients are so hard on themselves. They're thinking of everything they can't do. But if yesterday it was 50 feet and today it's 45 feet, it may be difficult to see that, but if we have it on paper, we can see that our dog is improving, even if it's just a couple of inches, that's still improvement. And training is never a straight line, as every trainer in here will tell you, it's never an A to B, it's all over the place. There's good days, there's bad days. There are days when your dog just says, nope, I don't wanna do it at all. So we need to understand where that threshold is on a daily basis and what we can do to help our dogs recover. Is it sleep? Are they missing a lot of their sleep time? Are they getting over aroused because they had a lot of playtime and then they saw other dogs? Creating a safe place, whether it's a, a den, a small room, turning off the stimulation, putting the lights down, putting on some nice music, some lavender oil and a diffuser or something where they can actually just relax and not have to worry about each little sound out in the real world, which may be spiking their energy. And then we can track how long it takes to recover. And that is equally as important as how fast our dog maybe reacts. So working out in the real world, using the environment for tricks and games. This is a basic weave. We're just figure eight walking. We're creating an opportunity for our dog to pay attention and use that active listening by not necessarily walking in a straight line like they're practicing. We have Bentley here at the bottom running through a bike rack, using our go through or even adding in yeah, high five at the end. That was his reinforcement. He went through, instead of an instant treat, he got a high five. So practicing alternative reinforcements out in the environment as well. Using your dog's natural abilities. It may be jumping up on things. It may be walking in a zigzag. I know German shepherds are the best at zigzagging and it can be really frustrating to a lot of owners that their dog doesn't want to walk in a straight line. So thank you all so much for coming and participating. I hope that you got some good information out of this. And this is what I have to continually offer for you. If you're a pet parent, I'd love to set up a strategy call with you. Go ahead and take down the information, take a picture of it, take, uh, we'll, we'll, this will be in a recording that'll also be sent to you guys if you registered. So 
You can text me directly if you're in the States or I have WhatsApp, that totally works as well. You can email me, but setting up a strategy call so that we can talk about where your dog is at, how we can help them progress. And then you're also gonna get a pass to take three class, to take three of our tricks and manners class in our next series, starting at the end of September. For our trainers, I would love to set up a coaching call so that you can utilize this type of class, whether it's online or in person, in a group setting. We have the tricks and manners template that I use to teach the series. I've been teaching these the, the classes for months and months and months, and you'll be so surprised what our reactive dogs can get out of it. We also, for the dog trainers, have uh, the high quality videos that you saw in this trick training. Those are brought to us by Empowered Dog and we have partnered with them. I wanna say thank you so much again to Yo and Michelle who put all of that, the filming, the editing, the making sure that we have the scripts to teach so if you're a trainer working on your own or in a smaller environment, or you're trying to push into more online classes, having these videos can cut your work down by hours and hours and hours. And we have that opportunity to engage you in those templates, in those videos. So we will open it up to see if anyone has any questions. If you need to uh, go ahead and take a picture of the information, set up a call, a strategy call, or how we can upgrade your training classes as a trainer, visit our website, caninelearningacademy.com. We have more YouTube videos. We have social media. This is an amazing class to offer, to have fun, to remember that working with your dog is a partnership. Instead of just, oh, I've got to train my dog, I've got to train with my dog. I'm going to enjoy training with my dog. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for all of the incredible well wishes in the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. This is, we're opening this up to our live q and I get to train with my dogs. Yes, Carrie, I love that. I'm gonna Nicholas stop recording now, okay? Just for yeah. the q and okay. If you all wanna unmute yourself, you're welcome to. You can type it in the chat.